Welcome back, everyone. Let's get start with the afternoon agenda items. We're going to start off with the Atlantic Surf Clam and Ocean Cohog Industry presentation by Dr. Roger Mann. Roger, whenever you're ready. Uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the council, uh, friends, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present a few short slides today to try and put this in context. Now, my presentation is not going to suggest to you what your actions should be. It is purely to sort of state what the nature of the problem is. And so there'll be a few slides and then that'll be followed by a video that was, was made through our CEMFIS group with the, the, the very able collaboration of the groups from Stowe Boat who are sitting behind us. And again, I hope that will sort of help lay out the problem. So this is about co-occurrence of, of two different species. And I think this one should work. Yes. This graphic actually isn't mine. It's 1969. And it, it's about the distribution of these two species inshore and offshore over the range for which they're fished. And it was from a publication by Arthur Merrill and John Ropes. What I'd like you to look at in this thing is just how much overlap there is amongst these two species as we move from George's Bank on the left to Virginia on the right. And the point here is there's not much. Each of the units along the x-axis here is a depth range of three meters. So the point is, is that back in those days, fishing management was easy. They were separated by depth. There wasn't much overlap. Since that time, the Middle Atlantic has warmed. Uh, the cold area out on the continental shelf where the cohogs live has gotten progressively warmer. The inshore boundary with warm water has sort of moved seasonally offshore. And this has become an increasing problem in terms of mixed catch. Now, you've seen one, one copy of this particular graphic before Jessica showed it to you at the last meeting in December in Annapolis. This was a survey that was done in the fall of 2021 to try to examine this area of overlap. There's four colors on this. Basically, if it's purple, it's surf clam turf. If it's green, it's ocean quahog turf. And everything else in the middle is mixed. So if you're in the business of trying to target one or the other, you have a major problem out there because at least, except for this marginal area on the inshore and the marginal area on the offshore, if you're in either sort of the yellow, orange, or the brown, then what you're liable to get is a mixed catch. And if you're out there operating for business, this is a problem. We have the next one. Ah, there we go. So when we want to sort of look at this, you say, well, how much of it is a problem when you're actually operating the vessel? And so you're going to see a couple of these bar graphs. Um, the dark is the surf clam, the hedged is the ocean coogs. And if you look at the depth ranges across the bottom, what you see is that there's a very substantial area now of LPUE landings per unit effort where these two overlap. And if you're targeting the areas where you want to have a certain LPUE that's actually going to make you any money, what you're looking at is about a 15 meter depth range where both of them occur. Both of them being the, the minor representation is still up around 25% or higher. Now, again, the depth range, you say, well, it's only 15 meters. But if you go back to the plot that's before, that's actually a very large piece of real estate where these guys operate. This is a progressive, for want of a better term, invasion of the deeper water by the surf clams. And so you can see this in terms of a very simple plot. What's the maximum size of the surf clams? And this is the dark bars here. Inshore, they're bigger. Offshore, they're smaller. And basically what you're seeing here is this is the maximum size. The smaller ones on the offshore depths are where, in fact, you're getting more recent recruitment and they're gradually growing into the fishery. So the big ones are inshore, and what you don't see, if you look at this in terms of mean size, which would incorporate all of the size classes, what you're seeing is that, that mean size inshore is remaining quite high. You're not getting as much recruitment in those inshore areas. You're getting more recruitment into the deeper areas. And so again, these past two slides show you what is a progressive invasion of ocean coog territory, or former ocean coog territory, by surf clams. And so you see this all the way across this depth range. And so if we think about this now in terms of where we are compared with where we were the 1969 data, there's now exhibit substantial overlap. Surf clams are dominant at under 40. 
meters, ocean coags over 40, but in the 40 to 55 meter range, which is a very substantial piece of real estate out there, what you see are these mixed catches. And the nature of the minor component of the catch is not that it's just a few percent, it's actually more than that. And if you're looking for the desired CPUE or LPUE, depending on what you call it, catch per unit effort or landage per unit effort for surf clams, in particular is in this region of overlap. Um, the progression that we see of this invasion is that it's not going to change in the near future. And indeed, all of the indication is that this period of overlap, the size of it is actually going to persist. And thus, we arrive at this discussion of what we do about the landing of mixed species in these catches. That's the science. That's the data that's behind it. And so that's the ending of my PowerPoint presentation. There is this now short video, which we made as sort of an educational, informative um, presentation. And again, with the guys from Stove Boat, I'm going to hand this back to Jessica, and she can run that for you. And then I'm going to sit down, and your conversation with industry representatives, I think, is after that. So thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. Ocean, the world that doesn't have a symbiotic bacteria in it, and it grows up to 180, 190 millimeters. Over the time that these have been fished, they've been separated.
So if there are any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Uh, I think it's fairly straightforward. Um, your choice as to what we want to do. Thank you. Any questions for Roger? Comments? Peter Hughes? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Roger, for the video. I think there's a couple of things I, <clears throat> I would point out in the video. <clears throat> Number one, that's probably, and Roger or, or somebody else in the audience, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that's probably the largest uh, clam vessel on the east coast of the United States, um, uh, the pursuit. Um, I, I'm not sure that there are others that are larger than that, but uh, yeah. It, it is one of the largest, yes. Okay. So um, a lot of other clam vessels are much smaller than that. And the other thing to remember in this is this is a research trip. This is not a working trip. But it's a working research trip where they are harvesting a five-minute tow, um, you know, what, whatever their cycle is. Um, so you're not seeing a boat that's working at full capacity and how fast those belts move. You're looking at clams walk across, go across that belt, you know, almost in an individual basis. And that's not necessarily the case in real life scenario, like squid fishing. You know, those squid coming across the belt, they, that belt needs to be full. Those, the, those belts on, on the clam trips are full every time. But just remember in the back of your heads that this is a research trip that you're seeing and they're not full toes. Um, so, there's, so there's very few clams, although there are a lot of clams, there are very few clams um, Coming across because it, it's not it's not fully fully working vessel um, in a commercial sense. So, um, and correct me if I if I para, paraphrase that incorrectly. No, that, that is that is correct. Um. Dewey. So what do you do? You've got a problem. Most folks around this table, including myself, have never been on a clam boat. Industry knows the issue. So what are you recommending to do to solve it? And is that doable with the council process and Magnus and Stevens and whatever else has to be done? So far to date, I haven't, I haven't heard in a couple presentations of how to fix it, if it's fixable. So I would hope as we continue on, and I might be wrong, that I hear from industry, whether it's to do away with the law, whether it's to build a machine that sorts, whether it's to get new processing or anything else. So, so I'm hearing it and I'm watching it and I see the issue, but I'm not hearing, I'm not qualified uh, for remedy. So I'd like to hear remedy of what industry is looking for. They told us and documented the problem. So I'll be quiet and tell me what the solution is. Thank you. Dewey I, Dewey, I think that's my cue to sit down and let the people who actually do this come sit here instead. So if there are no other questions for me, again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Roger. Peter Hughes. Thanks. I couldn't find my hand raised thing. Um, Dewey, that's the next presentation. So, so hopefully that'll answer some questions and generate more questions around the table. So thanks.
James Fletcher. Is that the same survey we used to estimate the amount of clams out there or the same type? Because I swear, what time I spent on a boat 30, 40 years ago, there was a thousand times more passing down the belt. Is that what we're using for the estimate of the population out there? I know it's the, the same type of people and stuff doing the surveys. That That's nowhere, even a 10% of what normally runs down those belts. Thank you. Jessica. Hi, Jim. Um, as Roger pointed out, this was an example of a research trip. The federal survey that the center conducts, the CLAM survey, is also conducted on the, um, the vessel pursuit. So it's a similar um, vessel. Um, I'm sure depending on the different tows that they do, they do that over, I think, um, what is it, 15, 20 days, Roger, when they do the, do the survey. Um, some of those toes probably have more clams moving over the belt than others, um, but that is the vessel that they use for the survey. So you're correct there. Sir, your observation is correct. This is in survey mode. It's not in fishing mode. If it was in fishing mode, that belt would be as deep as you can get, and it's running continuously. So your observation of an active fishing boat is correct. This is what you see when these vessels are fishing at this point in time now. The purpose of us slowing it down is so that we can count and size everyone and do the distribution. So th there is a difference. Michelle Duvall. Don't leave yet, Roger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So one question I meant to ask, you mentioned that, um, you know, on the, on the federal survey that it doesn't cover the region that is causing the problem. What are the what are the depths, the range of the federal survey compared to what you all did here? It's not that the federal survey doesn't cover it. it. It does. It's just that the density of the stations is much lower, and so the discrimination of what's happening over this depth range is is even though you see it in the federal data, it's a rather sparse data set, and that doesn't guide what you're trying to do when you're trying to fish in those targeted areas. Seeing no more hands, uh, let's start diving into Dewey's questions. And Jessica, I think you have a presentation on the Atlantic Surf Plan Ocean Cohog Separation, uh, Speed Separation Requirement Amendment. So whenever you're ready. Hi, dude. Um, great. Stephen's got the talk up. All right. So um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the um, species separation requirements amendment. Um, so for today, I'm going to provide you a quick recap of where we are with this action. Um, we last talked about it in December, and I know there's been a lot of merriment and eggnog since then. So just we'll make sure that everyone's on the same page as in terms of where we left off. Um, I'll provide an overview of our January 26th fishery management action team and advisory panel meeting. Um, both groups met together on that date. Um, we reviewed the fishery management action team action plan for 2023. And uh, the FMAT used that time to gather input um, from the advisory panel and members of the fishing industry that attended that meeting, um, input on some ideas for solutions that could be incorporated into um, the amendment. So the purpose of this action is to modify um, the species separation requirements in the surf clam and ocean quahog fisheries. Um, the amendment proposes regulations that would um, be modified to allow for mixed catches in the fisheries. And this was an issue that was raised to the council's attention by the fishing industry uh, a few years back. Um, as noted by uh, Roger in his presentation at present, you can only land surf clam or quahog on a fishing trip. Um, and the cages on board are expected to be the target clam species for that trip and tagged with ITQ cage tags um, to reflect that. 
The original rule uh, for these species separation measures went into place back in 1993, and it was developed to, um, those measures were developed to enhance enforcement, to provide more accurate tracking of individual quotas, and to allow for adequate monitoring of the fishery um, and the catch monitoring. So back in December, um, after a series of public hearings, the council was presented with the draft amendment and you voted to delay final action on that amendment and send, um, and send the work back to the committee and the FMAT to continue to develop uh, additional alternatives uh, to be considered at a later 2023 council meeting. So that was the last action that you took related to this. So at this January meeting, um, this January 26th meeting, um, we were able to provide uh, information um, in your briefing materials. There's a summary of um, important points that were brought out both by the advisory panel and the FMAT that's behind your briefing book tab. There's also a number of comments behind that tab. There's three comment letters that were provided um, on this amendment. Um, and there's also, I wanna note another comment letter that was provided on Nantucket Shoals. Uh, which is in your briefing materials as well. So it was on a um, slightly um, a, a topic, a clam topic, but not related to this action specifically. So the fishery management action team finalized the action plan after that meeting. Um, so the modifications to the action plan, um, really the only part of it that was modified from what you've previously seen was the timeline for 2023. So I'm gonna walk through um, the proposed um, process steps that the FMAT's planning to go through over the next year and a half as we work on this action. Um, so we had that January 26th meeting. Um, I'm providing you with this update today. Um, the fishery management action team is planning to have a meeting on April 12th to discuss some of the possible solutions that the industry has provided um, to the FMAT with some additional experts, um, individuals from the analysis program support division at GARFO, Office of Law Enforcement, some of the port agents, um, talk through some of the ideas that were presented um, and figure out how some of these ideas could be developed into alternatives. Um, in April, a little later in April, um, the FMAT, um, outputs from that meeting could be presented during the advisory panel fishery performance report meeting um, that's scheduled in April. Um, and that performance report then feeds into the May SSC meeting and our normal specifications process. We're anticipating the need for a, a good amount of development work to develop these alternatives. So the FMAT is expecting to develop the alternatives between May and September. Um, and that may include some additional um, FMAT meetings, advisory panel meetings, or committee meetings um, to be scheduled as needed. And then in September, we're expecting to have the committee meet, um, look at those alternatives that have been considered and develop recommendations on those. So then in October, 2023, the council would have the opportunity to uh, review and approve any additional alternatives that could be included in the amendment. Um, once any additional alternatives are added, um, then the action team would need to complete the draft public hearing document and components of the environmental assessment. So that would happen between October 2023 and January 2024, that again could include um, an additional AP and committee meeting to review that document. So the council would be looking at approving a public hearing draft for this action around February 2024. Um, we could go out for public hearings in a comment period in April um, or May, and then plan to take um, this information back to the committee and then potentially back to the council in June 2024. So we're looking at about a year and a half um, timeline. Uh, the action team um, did talk about the amount of time um, that's been budgeted here and seemed to feel that was reasonable. Um, during the meeting, we did have one advisor ask um, about the timing of this um, and how long it might take. Um, but I, I think in our discussions there, we pointed out that if things move faster, 
and the development moves more quickly, then these steps in the process would move along more quickly. Um, but given um, the scope of some of the um, suggestions and how they might affect different parts of the regulations, um, it, it seemed um, uh, wise to budget that additional time to work through some of these issues as we consider alternatives. So the other part of the meeting um, was spent um, reviewing um, some written and verbal recommendations from members of the industry and advisory panel members on some of the solutions that could be considered. Um, there's three documents that um, were submitted in writing and those are in your materials. Um, and some common themes came out of those in terms of the recommendations. Um, the advisors and uh, industry members had indicated that they had a, had a meeting a few days um, before we did, and they generally agreed on a few things. Um, one was that they felt that the possession of mixed catches should be allowed. Um, and they felt that the final accounting and sorting of surf clams and ocean cohogs should occur at the dealer processing facility. And in this case, most of those are one and one in the same. Um, they felt that the quota accounting should use bushels instead of um, cages, the tagged 32 bushel cages is the unit of measure for landings. And they also noted that um, they felt they should be able to recoup the number of bushels landed for those non-target species in the cage. So that could be credited to a tag um, for future use. So for example, if you had um, 30 bushels of surf clams and two bushels of ocean cohogs, and it had been tagged as a 32 bushel um, of surf clams, they wanted to have the ability within the tracking um, to recoup um, that additional um, two bushels in that cage. So that's something new that um, isn't um, built into the current management system. So digging into a little more detail on the on-vessel um, sorting ideas, they did suggest that um, they thought that some sorting already does and could probably continue to occur on the vessel. Um, however, you know, they felt that the crew discards as much as possible at sea, um, and they could do some of that sorting, but it wasn't something that they felt needed to be mandatory. Um, they also felt that on, on board the vessel, that single species declaration needs to change and that that presence of both species um, should be allowed on those vessels. Um, they again em emphasize that both on board the vessel and that at the dealer, they wanted to see more of this bushel based accounting and moving away from um, that one tag e equaling a 32 bushel cage as part of the tracking system. Um, they also um, had some other suggestions, and one was that the clams that were separated at sea, um, one option could be potentially to sort some of those and then tag those separately with a species-specific tag. Um, but there were also some recommendations from others that suggest, suggested the idea of using some sort of mixed species tag um, for these cages and trips. The group did talk a little bit about hail weights at all, uh, or hail weights a bit, um, and that if a vessel um, couldn't do all the sorting that was required, um, that they could potentially provide an estimate of how much of the other species is on board um, or an estimate of a hail weight um, like they do in other fisheries um, before they land um, at, the, at, the, at the dock and take that product to the dealer or processor for further sorting. They noted, you know, at sea can provide some level of separation um, but that the plant provides that further final level of separation as an option. So they also um, talked about some ideas for um, at the dealer and at the processor. Um, there was interest in having um, some sort of, sort of an allowance for the transport um, and possession of both species separately um, or mixed in cages at the plant. So again, um, having that ability to have mixed species as the vessels and then having that ability to have those mixed species um, at the plant as well. They felt that the plant records um, should be uh, for both enforcement and data reporting of the catch of both um, surf clams and ocean cohogs. Um, and they felt that the plant was really the place where separation could be most practically accommodated 
versus on board the vessel with all the things going on, um, you know, the speed of the belts um, and uh, all the other at sea considerations. So they definitely felt strongly that um, separation should happen at the plant or the dealer. We did talk a little bit about um, protocols for counting and for sorting. Um, so some of the advisors indicated that they were not supportive of a common protocol for counting. So having um, a very specific way to do it, given the different needs of the processors and their different setups. Um, some of the processors um, take their cages and, and use the cages to move the product into the processing line. Um, others felt that um, it might be appropriate to use sort of volume measured um, hoppers or something like that in order to put product into to measure the amounts. So they said there, there different processors might, might have different needs. It make, may make more sense for some processors sorting that volume to put them back into the cages uh, to make it easier for them. So they, they, however, felt that reporting by a common unit um, the bushel, so that volumetric unit should be sufficient. They um, also talked a little bit about the ability to transfer non-targets um, to other processors. Um, at least one, um, one advisor had noted that um, even though they're a single species um, surf clam processor, they have a nearby um, group that processes ocean quahogs, so they um, would have interest in having the ability to take those um, products that they aren't processing and move those um, so to, to a different facility for processing. Um, they also noted the ability um, and the desire to take um, those estimated non-targets that were in the cages and again, crediting those back somehow in those bushels to those allocation users. So other things, um, and there were a lot of things that were discussed at the meeting, so that's the summary that was provided has a lot more detail, as do these letters. Um, but some of the other things that um, were discussed, um, the idea was put forward um, of testing or counting this, sep this, testing this counting separation process in one of the plants. Um, so having a pilot before implementation, um, so all the kinks can be worked out in terms of the methodology and how that might work. Um, the FMAT did note um, to the advisors in those discussions that um, the exempted fishing program um, could provide that kind of opportunity if there was a plant that wanted to develop a um, research sort of monitoring project to bring in those mixed catches and then work through a sorting procedure. So that opportunity is available um, if that's something they wanted to pursue. We also um, had an advisor actually while we were talking about our action planning asked about um, management strategy evaluations as a tool to evaluate um, some of these alternatives. And they specifically asked who would potentially initiate a MSC. And we discussed that a bit, that um, we have, our council has done management strategy evaluations before. They have a summer flounder MSC going. Um, I think we previously funded a recreational one. Um, so that's something that the council would um, initiate. Those are typically, you know, big multi-year projects that address a very specific question. Um, although we did discuss the fact that that's typically driven by a need on the technical side or an FMAT or someone asking the council for something like that because they don't have the information that they need available. Um, it was noted um, that this, uh, by the advisors, that this new process of accounting um, this um, bushel-based tracking that they were recommending and doing the sorting at the processor, they felt that that would reduce uncertainty in our catch estimates in this fishery. Um, and some industry advisors noted that they felt the proposed solution was simple to implement and required a uh, few regulatory changes. Um, I will note that some of the, um, we had an FMAP member that did respond to that comment and say, um, some things that appear simple sometimes can be quite complicated, and some of the suggested solutions here would require a lot of changes to the other side of the house in terms of how we handle data, how we track um, catch and allocation. Um, so this, this, there may be a bit more complexity 
to this than um, is on face value. But during this meeting, we really didn't get into the detail of really unpacking a lot of these issues. Um, we had some FM members ask about the ability to track areas fished. Um, that's an important component of this fishery. And right now, the, um, the ability to track tags and the ability to track those areas fished um, for surf clams or quahogs is linked up to the, um, the clam logbook vessel trip reports on board the vessels. So if the catches are being mixed there um, and then brought back to the processor for sorting, it's important to have that ability to um, track that catch back to the location for a number of reasons. One is for the stock assessment um, because they use that area-based information as part of the stock assessment. The other component is for public health because we have some closed areas. Um, for public health, so having the ability to track that catch back to that. Um, and when we talked to our advisors um, about that, they did note that um, that may, tracking the, the area may require some changes to how they do things because right now um, some processors run one vessel's catch at a time, whereas other processors may have catch from multiple ves vessels in their cooler before they do their processing. So if they were intending to do the sorting at the processing facility, it may be an issue if you have vessels from different locations and you're sorting all of that product at the same time. So um, again, um, more details on all of this is provided um, in, in the, um, the comments and in the meeting summary um, that was available to you. This kind of just hits the, the big picture sort of highlights of what was discussed. As I noted in the action plan, um, the fishery um, management action team is planning to have this April 12th discussion and take some of these ideas and work through these in a very structured way with some um, of the expertise related to law enforcement, um, our data streams, some of the port agents that are really familiar with the processors, the ports, the vessels, um, and work through that to figure out what um, what may be folded into um, feasible alternatives for the, the committee and um, the council to consider. So um, that's my presentation, Mr. Chair. I'll take any questions. Any questions for Jessica? Dewey? So I have just one comment. It sounds like, it looks like you have a plan. Uh, so, so, so a workable plan and looking at it. So that that's good. So uh, I like I like something that's uh, got an action item that it's looked looked across at all aspects of to solve a problem. Thank you, Peter Hughes. Thanks and thanks for those comments, Dewey. Um, I listened in on this meeting. I did not participate in the meeting, but I listened in on the APF map meeting, um, and I thought that they. Um, it was a very uh, dynamic meeting in the fact that they, um, they, 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 they're looking for solutions. They're looking for solutions also. And Jess said something earlier that, you know, sometimes things might look easy, but they're a lot more difficult than, than we thought they were going to be. But I do have a question for Jessica. Um, on slide 13, your first bullet point, um, idea of testing, counting, separation process in one plant. A pilot program before implementing, and that the FMAT noted that the EFP options. And I'm wondering if, if, uh, what that would do to the timeline, or would that not affect the timeline? That would just be something. An EFP would be something that would run outside the timeline, which would provide information to the. FMAT for maybe a following action because I don't think an EFP in in the the timeline that you've uh, laid out for us um, is going to generate enough information for the FMAT to be able to uh, you know make 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 rational decisions on um, with a limited amount of data. Um, so I like the idea of a pilot program. I like the idea of the EFP. I just think it's going to take more than a few months of data to populate enough information to, you know, be useful to the to the, to the FMAD. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. 
Well, um, so the the exempted fishing permit um, aspect is something that at this point, any member of the industry, if they developed a well-developed um, research project associated with that, I think they could um, apply for that. That's That's been available for the last few years to them, and it's available to them right now um, to go ahead and develop a proposal through that EFP. And that would then go through the service they'd consider whether or not um, to, to issue an EFP for that project. Um, I could see, I, I don't think, um, I, I don't think there would be a need to put the FMAT work on hold or delay the work that we're doing, exploring these other alternatives. Um, if, if a group is working on an EFP um, or a pilot project, looking at this more specifically, but I could see where something like this could run concurrently um, and could maybe inform or re refine um, approaches to how those sorting protocols may be implemented, um, or I could see where um, it could in, inform the process um, either concurrently or after the fact. Um, if a project came out and came up with a really great protocol that was even better than what was um, what, what was being contemplated. Um, so I, I don't see them as um, conflicting with one another potentially, but the the FMAT wouldn't be the one developing an EFP. This is something that um, someone else would need to develop, a processor or a dealer working with folks come up with a, a protocol and then sub submit that through the process with NEMS. Great, I appreciate that. Thank you, Jessica. Eric Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I mean, sorting at the plant level makes the most sense to me, but it's my understanding that there's no artificial intelligence, so this has to be done by hand. Is that right? Okay, so my next question is about dollars and cents. More handling means more people, which means more money. Is there enough margin from the boat to the end of processing to support that kind of a plan in the short term. It's got to come out of something. It always comes out of the hatch. That's the way I see it. So I don't, I don't know. You want to try, Jessica? If not, Sam said he'd try. Come on up, Sam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Reed. Yeah, I mean, from a plant perspective, it's much easier to get employees on land than it is to get crew members on a boat in order to do this type of separation. We're already having trouble getting crews and the margin on the boats and the clam business is much smaller than it is on the processor side. So it, even though it would be a, by hand at first, it would be much easier to get the uh, labor pool to do that. Well, the spread, the economics of it, if we don't have access to these areas, the economics won't make any sense. And that's the bottom line here. We're trying to figure out how we can separate to the extent possible with manpower on our boats. And we can't establish a single protocol for the boats because there, there's a diversity of size and, and uh, of the boats and a, a limited amount of room in order to do this with. You saw the ESS Pride, the biggest boat in the fleet. Our boats are some of the smaller boats in the fleet. So we really need to do this. And I was going to save these comments for the future, but you know, I'm, I'm the guy that said this was simple. Raise my hand on that because I think it just needs to align with every other fishery that we have. And I believe my context is the fact that we're in all the other fisheries and we're catching them in the ocean with bycatch. We're separating them to the extent possible on the boat. And then when we get to the dealer, it is further separating them and then reporting it to SAFIS so it can come against the quotas. Every other fishery does that. Ours does not do that because we have a 32 bushel tag, which is no longer representative anymore because we are having these mixed cages. Take that component out and just count the bushels that the plant has to separate anyway because they can't run the lines because of their 
uh, their sales, they can't mix the meats together, you will have the bushel count that will go into uh, the program in order to figure out what we're actually catching. Sorry, but it's, to me, it's just that simple. Align it with all the other fisheries we have now. And we can still keep the integrity of the ITQ system where we can transfer the tags back, transfer the bushels back and forth. Thanks. Sam, one second before you step away. What would you say would be the time saving as far as being out in the ocean? Instead of a three day trip, could you cut it down to a two day trip to save on costs overall? And some of that cost could, the plant could help kind of pick that up. Yeah, there'd be more money for the plant, I guess, or for the boat. But I mean, some of that cost could be used in the separation at the dock. Well, you would still want to separate as much as you, in my opinion, you would still want to separate as much as you can on the boat because the plant can't handle but so much. So if you utilize what the boat could handle during its operations without trying to slow the boat down, separate that, allow the tags, uh, allow the cages to come in separated and whatever is mixed in the other cages where they could not get out further gets separated at the plant. They'll have, they'll have the accounting at the plant. So to me, it's a, it, if we allow the landing of both species or the possession of both species on the boat, then you're going to have both sides doing the separating. You're going to have the boat to the extent possible, economically viable, not to slow down, and then the plant can pick up the slack, and then the plant has all the product in its possession in order to account for it uh, through safest or whatever other means there is for, the, for NOAA. So I don't think you'd really shorten a trip. I think that you would, um, I think you would be eliminating a regulatory discard because right now they're just going overboard. I mean, just as fast as they can throw them and we still can't get them all out. So to me, just the possession, changing the possession and changing where the, where the reporting comes from uh, will put the uncertainties at a much lower position than they are now because that's what we did. We brought this, you know, to you because it's a problem for us. And, and like the presentation by Brother uh, uh, Roger Mann uh, mentioned, we're going to lose a lot of area because if we don't get out of this legal jeopardy, we, we eventually just cannot fish there anymore. And unfortunately, climate change is putting us in that position. So I'm just asking for it to be aligned with other, every other fishery we have. I mean, we're in ground fisheries, we're in scallops, we're in fluke, sea bass, squid, ELX, lolligo. There's no problem with accounting for those because it's accounted by the pound and it's accounted at the dealer. That's all we're asking for here. Just, I keep saying, I think it's simple. And I know it's not, we have to change some things on the back side of this. But from a fishery harvest perspective, we just have to align it with whatever we're doing now in our other fisheries. And, and that way we don't have to be in this legal jeopardy that we're in, that we're not in, in other fisheries that as long as you have a permit for it, you can catch it. You can harvest, you can, you can declare a surf clam trip and still have some bycatch. You can declare a quahog trip and still have some bycatch. You're still gonna have the same BTR reporting that we have now, which is an estimate of your target and bycatch. That's not gonna change. The only thing that has to change here is where we do the accounting from and get rid of the 32 bushel tag. Now, if the ISSC through traceability needs us to tag that cage, that's not a problem. We do that in our state inshore fisheries now. We tag it with a shellfish tag so that we can trace that all the way back. We have separation requirements in our plants now because we have to be able to trace our product all the way back to the boat. So we can't mix the product up when it's at, at if it's the same two different boats and the same species, we can't mix that because we have to trace that back to the harvest area. So we still can't do that. So there's a lot of things that are already in place here, but you know, it's just a matter of, of aligning them with what we already do in our other fisheries. And I think it can be done. And I think everybody wants to do it, um, but that's kind of the, the easy terms of it. But to answer your question, it, it won't slow down the trip that much. Okay. Dewey? You gave too much common sense here. Uh, the whole idea is to, is to count the clams, is the end result. And so what if they're mixed in, in the cage? 
Uh, you come to the dock, they get sorted out. You throw a number of how many cages you got, they get sorted out. You got two piles. You got this many surf clams, this many cohogs, it's written down. What's, what, what's the issue if that happens like you described? Uh, I, I mean, I'm kind of baffled, like, what's wrong with that? I think before they just had to declare either a surf clam trip or an ocean quahog trip. And now if they, if they can get this to go through, there won't be an exact trip and they'll hopefully be able to separate them at the dock. And then it'll be like a dealer report with you. You have your guesstimating you've got a thousand pounds of yellowfin tuna and you got 500 pounds of big eyes. Well, you don't know till you get to the dock. So basically they're going to ha even have to change the reporting requirements on how they do it, on how they're going to report. So basically, it just becomes a, I guess, a regulation change, rules change on reporting. I, I mean, it seems it, it, it's. I guess I'm missing some. I don't see why what, why it's not that this easy. Just looking at a regulation change, as long as the uh, clams are getting accounted for, what does it matter? If the end game is counting the number of clams against your ITQ or something like that. And for science, what does it matter if, if who, who or where they do it at, as long as that's happening and it's verified as Sam described here. So it's, I, I guess I, I, uh, I'm just a little confused as why it seemed like it was complexer than that until he uh, talked about a uh, process of doing it. So I, I'll be quiet, but I just, I think it's a good idea what you said, a simplicity and I don't see why the end result is the count clams and That's they're separated. Do you want to take it, Eric? Yeah, I do. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this is a no-brainer. <laughs> I'm not sure why we're talking about it other than changing the regulations here and there. <laughs> I mean, if it's, if it's, done, it's done in a plant, I mean, clams have a shelf life. It's not a week. It's like a couple hours for some, some ungodly short amount of time. So your timeliness of your reporting is going to be pretty good. Um, the accuracy of your reporting is going to improve if you go to bushels and you have it done in the plant where you get every one. The thing that worries me the most is, do we mention it yesterday? Mr. Martin just mentioned it. It's mentioned it every time we talk about crews. If they have to do the sorting on the boat, and do all that much more work than they're doing now, there's going to be no cruise and nobody's going fishing. We got to fix this thing. It seems relatively simple to me. And I would think, uh, you know, MSC would certainly uh, look very kindly on a much more accurate reporting as well. Michelle Duvall. Can let Jessica go, Mr. Chairman, and then I'll follow up after her. All right, Jessica. Yeah, I w was just going to comment, um, going back to wh why these regulations originally went into place, um, there were aspects of them related to enforcement. So um, having that ability to check those tags, track, track the tags, and have um, um, the ability to distinguish between landings in state waters, federal waters, all of those different components were, were part of that. Um, but also this tagging, the 32 bushel tags are embedded in all of the allocation tracking, including the um, ownership database tracking, the um, transfers, the holding of allocation by banks that are then um, transferred and leased um, to other al allocation holders that may or may not use portions of the bushels that are associated with those tags. So there's a lot of systems that are built around um, the currency of tagging because this is an ITQ fishery. So I think I just want to point that out because I think that is some of the complexity um, and some of the suggestions um, for things such as, you know, when things are landed, having the ability to transfer those um, uh, species to other um, dealers and being able to track and tag and track the allocation components. There's a lot of moving parts here. So I just wanted, I, I, know, I know, again, some things 
look very simple on face value, but there's a lot of layers to our regulatory process and our data monitoring process that are all inter intertwined. Um, and that's something that would have to um, be looked at carefully or addressed if there were to be changes because it may affect multiple components in the system. So um, that, that's all I wanted to point out. Michelle Duvall. That's why I wanted Jessica to go ahead of me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks, Jessica. I think, you know, I can appreciate the complexity imposed by having built an entire system around the current currency that we have. Um, and so that's why it might take a little bit longer, but I think the accounting system clearly has to change just because of what's happening with the distribution of the species. So, you know, it's not, it's not gonna get better and it's probably gonna be bit painful to make those changes and I think you know carefully working through that is is going to be necessary you know maybe um, as was suggested you know possibly a, you know an exempted fishing permit might be one way to test some of those different some of those changes in accounting methodology um, you know obviously you have the electronic uh, electronic monitoring, you know, pilot that is currently going on to try to help, you know, find it a different technological way to shift the accounting process, but it does does have to change. I think that's the bottom line with what we're we're faced with here. So, and I, I appreciate I was able to listen into a good chunk of the conversation, so I really appreciated all the the robust discussion that happened at the um, between the FMAT and the AP. Dan Farnham. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Hey, Jessica, how often would one boat fish in, in state and federal waters on the same trip, or even fish in two different re reporting areas on, on the same trip? Do you know offhand? Well, the way the regulations are set up, they're, they're not supposed to be fishing in both of those on the, the same trip. Okay. Um, and I, I think that's that's part of Actually, if you read into the role with the, the basis for why these some of the tagging regulations originally went into place, um, it was to, to differentiate between trips where they were fishing in federal waters. So you declare in on that sort of federal trip and then you're tagging with federal tags versus a state trip like in state of New York or state of New Jersey where they would be fishing on that trip and then using um, I think I think those states, either New York or New Jersey, had tags as well. Um, I think for their allocations. Yep, yep. Thank you for that. So, so that would be a non-issue then, if if it's either going to be state or federal waters, that wouldn't be a problem. But what about like in two different reporting areas? Would that do they do they move between areas where they had to do two different VTRs? How does that work in the clam industry? Sam? Yeah. Sam, you want to come up? Yeah, we can move between fishing areas, uh, not from state to federal, but in the different uh, zones in the, in the ocean. We have to change a VTR for every time we change an area, which doesn't happen that much in the clam business, but it has no, no bearing on landing the clam. It's just your VTR reporting so that NOAA can track where you actually harvested the species at. Yep, just like every other fishery. Yep, very good. Thank you. I mean, to me, it sounds pretty simple too. I'm with, with Dewey here. Uh, you know, and going back to what Peter said before, and what we saw in the video was a, was a research trip. And, and I've been on a lot of commercial fishing trips. And if you're if you're not efficient and moving fast and and keeping things working, you're not making money. And if if you if you take a vessel. And, and decrease its efficiency by 20%, you're not dropping the, 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 the profit down 20%. You're taking, that could be the profit on, on a fishing trip. So for me, I think it's a no brainer to try and, uh, try and do this. Thank you. Adam Nowalski. Going back to what the proposed alternatives were back in December, it would seem that alternative three 
was the closest to the quote unquote simple solution in terms of allowing for a mixed trip um, with the hold up being this port side sampling essentially required dumping of the cages at the dock as I understood it. Now, I went back and looked at that proposed amendment at the time, the term dumping was never in the document that I found. So I'm just wondering about this port side sampling program, uh, where that element of dumping came from, and if perhaps there's a way to fast track whatever action we took here, if it is industries, the AP's idea that alternative three was in spirit the right way forward with some enhancements, if there's some way to fast track this by somehow limiting the work to further development around that, addressing just this idea of dumping cages on the dock. So you're right, we didn't propose in the amendment when the FMAT drafted it that the cages had to be dumped. It was this idea of having a port sampling monitoring program where either all of the product or some level of sampling um, was done to um, characterize the catch effectively, whatever amount of sampling would have been involved in that. And that was the proposal was for that to be port monitoring, um, a port monitoring program developed by NIMS that could have been dockside or it could have been processor dealer based potentially. Um, but some sort of that's what the original alternative had had said. Um, this uh, the, the proposals, I think that the advisory panel had put forward um, was for them to be doing that sorting themselves at the, the facility and then doing the reporting. So I think it's a little different, but in terms of the, the similarity, that's probably the closest alternative in the current amendment um, to what's um, been proposed. Lieutenant Commander Matt Cayley. I, I just thought I wanted to weigh in on the, from the enforcement perspective. Um, so whenever we Boredom at sea, um, from the NCE uh, point of view, we're probably looking at the, the, the tags and the cages and whether they're whether they're space. We're not we're not even really tell the difference between the two, and the boarding officers aren't getting that specific when they're going through. So they're primarily just looking at the cages and looking to make sure that tag is there, and then going through and checking the permit um, and, and making sure they have BMS on there. So whether that's a in the form of a bushel, similar to how we do for scallops, or or whether it's done with a tag, um, as long as that's from an enforcement perspective, as long as we're able to tell that this. You know, whatever the requirement is, it lines up with this tag uh, for this either bushel or cage. Um, that, that's kind of what we're looking for, what we're looking at. Any more questions, comments? Adam. So the one part of my question that I don't think was answered was, if we were to take some action here today to direct the FMAT in the scope of what they're going to develop, would there be a way to move this along faster? Is there something we could do today to help with that? Is that something that your sense from the FMAT AP meeting that the industry is even interested in seeing this? If we limited the scope here today, would they rather see this move faster with a limitation on the scope of what we're asking to be developed versus a more comprehensive look at the ideas that were presented at the last FMAT AP meeting, knowing that that's likely to be two plus years in terms of a final rule coming from the service. So uh, I, I guess, are, are you suggesting that the, the scope of the scope you would be limiting this to would be this suite of suggestions from the advisors that came out of this meeting that because I think the intent of the FMAT was to take these different ideas and there were quite a few of them I went I mean you saw there were a lot of different components to them um, and work through those proposed solutions with the FMAT with some of the expertise at um, GARFO um, the data people, the law enforcement folks, OLE, port agent, tr try to 
work through some of these and and figure out what could feasibly be developed into um, alternatives. I, I don't think um, if, if your intent is to narrow it to the scope of what the industry proposed at this meeting, I don't think that would affect the timeline at all, because I think the FMAT would still need to go through the same process of sitting down with the expertise, working through these issues um, and figuring out what how those could be developed into feasible alternatives. In those discussions, there may be some components of what was suggested that maybe some of these other experts have ideas on how to address those issues more efficiently. We won't know till we sit down with them, but I, I think that's going to take some time. And I think we'd still be looking at a um, an action plan that's spanning, you know, the next year and a half, um, especially given everyone's workloads. We have other things that we're working on other other than just this. So is, is that your intent when you're talking about to limit the scope? Is it to the scope of all of these suggestions um, or just the scope of changing the tagging or uh, that's not clear to me. But either way, I think any of those pieces, we would still need to walk through a, a methodical process with the FMAT, the action plan, meeting with the committee, the advisors, and kind of working that problem um, to um, some sort of solution that can be folded into an amendment. Adam. There's obviously been an awful lot of work done here. Um, I agree wholeheartedly that the FMAC can work with people and develop a very comprehensive set of potential solutions. That being said, I've heard at least three people here so far today. The one that's spoken from industry as well as two people sitting around the table say, and they think this is a simple problem and we should be able to have a more simple solution. So while I don't doubt that we could spend an awful lot of time coming up with things, at the end of the day, there's two nails, put two two by fours together, a hammer and some nails. You get the job done. And, and I'm just wondering if we're making way more work for ourselves than we need to. And I'm just looking for some simpler way forward here than another 18 months of FMAT, AP, uh, and more proposed options. We're going to look at it. We're going to review it. We've been down that road with so many of our processes. What we're proposing here today, I guess my message is just that it's in direct conflict with what we're hearing, that there ought to be a simpler approach. And, and maybe from staff's perspective, there just isn't. But I'm trying to throw something out there and say, can we put our heads together and find some simpler, faster way to do this? And if the answer is no, sorry, Mr. Nowalski, we can't. At least I put the out there and we had the conversation here today. Jessica. So we we did talk at the advisory panel FMAT meeting about um, the ideas that were presented here and that by the advisors and that many of these ideas are high level concepts, right? These these are general ideas about how they think this problem could be solved. Um, but there, uh, there's the saying, the devil's in the details. And there are a lot of details that need to be waited, that we need to wade through here um, with our technical experts. There are, there's a lot of moving parts. Our data systems, our enforcement systems, our monitoring systems, our catch monitoring, our allocation tracking are all intertwined. Um, and as you often know, sometimes when we change one part of the regulatory system, we have unintended consequences that happen to other parts of the system. That happens frequently. We try to look at all the different pieces that may be affected, make sure we address all the issues up front to the extent that we can. So I, I think what's been provided by the advisory panel, this is great. It's great that we're talking about a solution. We're talking about potentially doing the sorting at the processor level, that they think that is um, the space in terms of um, working through this issue. That was something when we were doing the white paper development, the FMAT talked about, you know, what about sorting at the dealer? And at the time they told us, no, that wasn't workable, but they're telling us this is workable now. So I think we need to let the technical experts really dig in um, and start to work on this issue. Um, but I, I think you want to do it um, carefully and methodically. We want to make sure that we do this um, in a way that we're not going to um, uh, 
to, to disrupt the allocation tracking or disrupt the catch monitoring system or any of those any of those parts in this process. So it's just a matter of being thorough, like we work through any of our actions. But unfortunately, this is this is an issue that I don't think there's it, I don't think you're gonna get a quick fix in the next three months. That's why the FMAT is proposing the next year and a half. Um, but there are very few problems you deal with that are quick fixes. And and you do know there with a lot of simple issues, there's a lot of details um, that you deal with and we need to work through. Um, so uh, I'll just leave it at that. Michelle Duvall. Yeah, I, I appreciate all of that. And, and especially it seems like there's, there's going to have to be some experimental back end, you know, transition proposals for, for the data that folks are going to have to work through. I mean, it would be a little bit different if we were just, you know, starting from scratch and building, you know, how the catch accounting and reporting and tracking was going to be, but, you know, because inconveniently, um, you know, these animals are shifting their distribution, it's really creating havoc with everything else. So I just, I mean, whether it's, you know, transitioning from a, you know, a tag is 32 bushels to can we, you know, given that we know there's going to be, you know, a certain proportion of um, a cage that is, you know, maybe it's 80% surf clam and 20%, you know, cohog, can we use a, a proportional conversion factor in, you know, a cage tag that is less than one, you know, and we, but I think those are details that need to be worked through so that, like Jessica said, you're not unintentionally breaking a different part of that long history of, you know, accounting. And that's just sort of an, you know, an inconvenient truth. Any more comments, questions around the table? Questions or comments from the audience? Dan Martin. Yeah, just just a couple components. I, I do believe that there is some back end data that's that's got to be figured out, but we just have to change a couple of components to align them. The 32 bushel tag is a hiccup for sure, but we trade and we lease and we purchase allocation by the bushel. That's already there. We have to do it in 32 bushel increments right now because there's a tag number that goes is associated with it. Change that one component, we fix that particular problem. When it comes to the financial aspect and the collateral to the banks, it's by the bushel. It's not by the tag. So we change that 32 bushel tag component, that problem's done. You know, I, I realize there's some things in the back, and it'll take a little, it'll be, a little bit of time to get it done. But I think what we're agreeing on is two critical components from the harvest side, and that is allow mixed catches, declared, reported properly in the same fashion we do now, and then count at the dealer. And then from there, how, how your data stream goes into your process, that's where we have to figure those things out. But I, I firmly believe it's the 32 bushel tag hiccup, which is the thing that's got to critically change. We change that and we just account bushels, just like we do now with LAGC lease uh, scallop allocation. It's by the pound. We lease it back and forth. It's tracked. Ownership is tracked. None of that's got to change. So we change those critical components to say, say, clearly these are the ideas, and we cut all those ideas down to three main points, four main points, and then you run that through your process, and you, and you basically say, okay, well, this has got to change, that's got to change, the other thing's going to change. And it might take several months. It might take six months. It might take a year. So I, I believe that that may have to happen, but it's just a couple critical components that we agree upon and we move forward on because like has been said this problem is not going away it's just going to get worse so those are my last comments i've said too much let me get a back corner here first sonny then i'll come back to you please state your name uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Joe Myers, and I'm the Director of Innovation and Sustainability with uh, Sea Watch International. So I think the, the real 
core tenet of, of kind of what drives our position on this is propose, uh, the proposal to sort and report, I'm sorry, not to sort, to report, to, to do the reporting to plant, the Medilla report, and secondly, to have it be an accounting uh, issue. So if you stick with those two tenets, I think you take care of kind of the core of everything. And then from that point, if, if any sorting that comes in, whether it be on the vessel or whatever, that just strengthens the plant's ability to be able to, to have that dealer report to be the point. Um, we, already, we already do the, the sorting because the market drives that. So whether it goes into a can or a frozen product, it has to be labeled separately. So we're already doing that, uh, kind of to your, to your point, Mr. Reed, we're, we're already building that in. And, and the throttle on that is that we have this prohibition. So we're, we're trying our best to keep that, um, the, the, basically the boats can't, uh, are, are, are delivering the catch to us that we can handle at the plant. Um, so we do have a proposal that we will bring forward for funding at the Sempus meeting coming up this spring to help us with some sorting technologies, that kind of thing. Uh, but, but that would be, you know, from our standpoint, and, and you know, other folks can sort where they like, but from our standpoint, we have the room, we have the ability to do that at our plant. And it's really, I'm speaking mostly from our plant and, uh, services, our Mid-Atlantic fleet, which is the one in Milford, Delaware. Um, that's where most of the, the mixing issue is, as we've stated before. Um, we also have a dockside plant that is up in New Bedford, Massachusetts. But, but just to kind of follow up, to finish up my comments, the really core tenet is the, the dealer report and the accounting exercise is, is, is really what we think would drive it. And kind of that simplicity uh, would, would be the core of our, our position. So thank you. Thank you. Sonny Gwynn? Yeah, just a question to the industry. What, um, so if you go on a surf clam trip and you come in with some mixing, what do you do with the cohauls? Thank you, uh, Peter Hemchak, LaMonica Fine Foods. So uh, to answer your question, uh, LaMonica Fine Foods, they hand chuck surf clams. They don't want any cohogs. They don't process any cohogs at the Millville plant, none. And it's an economic disincentive to have cohogs in surf clam cages. So uh, Dan, Le Dan Levecchia, the president, has X number of surf clam tags, which represent, each tag represents 32 bushels. And that's what he goes out and, and that's what he wants. And that's what he wants to pay the captains on a surf, 32 bushels of surf clams in a cage. So the cohogs, they have to come out at the plant because he's, he, some, some can be thrown overboard at sea if they, if they can talk, if they can handle it. But he, uh, they pull out every single ocean cohog because they don't process them. So when, what Dan would have to do is, is he'd have X number of bushels of ocean cohogs. And he would either, if, you know, under this tagging system, he might have to buy or lease ocean cohog tags uh, to have a tag available for every 32 bushels of cohogs. So he will either ship them to a processor that processes ocean cohogs. And I mean, Surfside is like 20 miles away and it's his cousin. So I, you know, if they're produce, if they're in production on cohogs, that's, a, that's a simple solution. If he can't, uh, if, if he can't send them to another processor, then uh, they, they get discarded. And uh, they're account they're still accounted for. Every every bushel is accounted for. So, um, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. I just want to see if they're utilized or not. Yeah, thank you. as much as possible. Jessica. So um, we did had one member of the public who was on the advisory panel that he intended to be here to ask a question, but wasn't able to connect today. 
Um, and so he emailed me this morning and I'm just going to ask the question on his behalf because I know we had some exchanges on this. So his question related to the use of um, the emer emergency rule and emergency rule guidance and whether any aspects of um, the allowing for mixed catches on board or other aspects of this issue could be addressed through emergency rulemaking to speed up the process in terms of trying to address it while the FMAT worked on its action plan and components of this independently. So that's a question um, he was planning to direct either to Mr. Penney or um, Mr. Almeida. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. So one of the first criteria for determining that an emergency exists and using an emergency rule authority under the Magnuson Act would be an unforeseen circumstance, given that the council has been working on this issue for several years and at the last meeting voted to stop work on an amendment that was had been scheduled to take final action on. Um, I can't see how we could cross that threshold. Thank you, Mike. Any more questions, comments? Seeing none, thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, I know the industry has been working hard. I encourage the industry to continue working very hard. Let's get this wrapped up as quickly as possible. And you know, that way, it, it's only going to benefit the industry guys anyway. So let's get it wrapped up as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, with that, let's take a little bit of a break. Uh, let's come back at come back at three ten. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There, room. Just FYI, you're not muted.
Welcome back, everyone, to the meeting. Before we get started on our next agenda item, I do want to recognize Commander Patricia Bennett, who used to sit at this table an awful lot. Uh, glad to see you. Thank you. Um, I'm just here to support Matt. I'm not providing any enforcement recommendations whatsoever, and I'm also here for what's going to happen at the end of the meeting, because you guys know me for that. Thank you. Matt actually said you have a 10 minute presentation and we've got your slideshow uploaded. Okay. We're now having a presentation by Samantha Werner on the cost survey for commercial fishing business whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So my name is Samantha Werner. I'm an economist at the North. East Fishery Science Center, and I'm in the Social Sciences Branch, and today I'm going to be discussing the Greater Atlantic Region Commercial Fishing Business Cost Survey for 2022. I'd like to recognize my team. Gregory Ardini is also an economist at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, and Elizabeth Conley is a contractor with Ocean Associates. Today, I will be discussing the survey and why, why it is relevant, as well as some important background information. I'm going to go over some previous response rates from previous implementations of the survey. Then I'm going to go over some improvements that we've made to the survey since. Excuse me, Samantha, can you speak up? Put the mic a little closer, please. Yeah, I don't usually have that problem where I'm being too quiet, so <laughs> I didn't want to yell. Is that, is that okay? Can you hear me now? Great. Yes. Okay, thank you. So then I'm going to go over after talking about the improvements that we've made since the last implementation. I'm going to close with some important details about the upcoming cost survey, which we are implementing this year. To start economic data are needed to better meet the requirements of legislation, such as MSA and national standard eight. But they're also in multiple objectives of the council's strategic plan, specifically objective seven and objective 11. Thank you. Where objective seven states to promote the collection of relevant social and economic data in all the water observations and objective 11 is to ensure that management decisions consider social, economic and community impacts and opportunities. So this is extremely, extremely relevant to the Greater Atlantic Region Commercial Fishing Business Cost Survey. This is a voluntary survey of federally permitted commercial fishing vessel owners. And the survey has been implemented by the Social Sciences Branch since the early 2000s. And we last implemented the survey in 2016 for costs incurred in 2015. So that was quite some time ago. The primary focus of this survey is to collect fixed and quasi fixed cost information. So these are costs that don't normally vary with the number of trips taken. And the one thing I really want to emphasize about this survey is that this is the only NOAA fisheries effort collecting these types of costs in the greater Atlantic region. Here are some of the specific examples of the information we collect using this survey. So you'll notice that everything highlighted indicates costs that aren't collected anywhere else in our region by NOAA Fisheries. And the only item that isn't highlighted is operating costs, because even though we do collect that within our survey, it is collected through other means. So you'll notice that we collect vessel repairs and maintenance, upgrade improvement costs, and that includes to the engine, hull, fishing gear, and safety equipment. We collect vessel costs such as permit fees, mooring fees, and vessel insurance. We also collect overhead costs, including business vehicle usage, association fees, workshop, and storage expenses. And then we also collect quota leasing costs and revenues, total payments to crew and hired captains, and the value of the vessel as well as the vessel permits.
This cost information is needed to understand costs facing regional commercial fishing businesses to track economic trends over time and assess the economic performance of fishing fleets. But it's also needed to assess the potential and realized economic impacts of fishery management policies. So normally when we conduct economic analyses for various frameworks or amendments, we generally use net revenues, which are revenues less trip costs. But we know this isn't a substitute for profitability. And not only that, but we know that there are changes in policies that impact individual cost line items. So you can think about changes to fuel or insurance or gear requirements. So we need this cost data to better inform our analyses and therefore better inform management decisions. That being said, we can only use the survey data if vessel owners participate in the survey. This is a voluntary survey, so participation has been a challenge in the past. For the 2015 effort, we received a 6% response rate for that survey. And that was down from 2011 and 2012, where we received a 29% and 20% response rate, respectively. You'll notice that dredge gear has the lowest response rate amongst the gears that we investigate, and that's consistent across all three of the past implementation years. And lastly, in terms of sheer number of individuals, pot trap represents the largest gear group sampled. Since the last implementation of the survey, we've been really focusing on boosting those response rates. So again, we last implemented the survey in 2016 for costs incurred in 2015. And we've been making a suite of changes to not only the survey itself, but also our, our methodology to try to reach this goal. So one of our major changes that we've made is we've gone from a one size fits all survey version to a gear based survey version. So now we have 10 different gear based survey versions. And this was informed by conversations with industry members where they said that they couldn't necessarily see themselves in the one size fits all survey version. And it also allowed us to tailor our questions as well as our examples to each individual gear type. We also were able to decrease the survey length and reduce the number of questions as well as the number of pages in our survey. And we were able to simplify certain sections of the survey, including the crew payment section. For this upcoming implementation, we also added an additional mode for participants to take the survey. So now Vessel owners can opt to take the survey via phone or virtual interview with a Northeast Fisheries Science Center staff member. And this is in addition to folks being able to take the survey online or in hard, co hard copy format. We also feel like this would be a great opportunity for industry members to contact us and hopefully go through this survey question by question, get clarity on what we're asking for specifically. So it will hopefully improve the data quality and also give folks the opportunity to ask more about the survey. We've also ramped up our outreach efforts, including the number of presentations we're doing. So presentations have always been done for the cost survey. So I just wanted to make that clear. But this time around, we have been trying to increase our opportunities to have face to face conversations with vessel owners. Greg Ardini was able to present at the New England Fishery Management Council meeting last month. We've presented to the port agents. We're also going to the Maine Fishermen's Forum, which we will have a table at the trade show and we'll interact with folks there. We're going to present to the Cape Cod Fishermen's Alliance. We're also presenting uh, to the ground fish sector managers. And then we're presenting at the Scallop AP commit, uh, and committee meeting in March. And that's really to boost up those dredge participants, given that we've had problem with that gear group responding to the survey in previous implementations. We've also worked with port agents to distribute flyers on our behalf and to promote the survey. We've also created a database of key industry groups and stakeholders, and we plan on calling and emailing them directly to encourage them to reach out to their networks on our behalf. 
We've also really increased our web presence this time around. So we've developed a project web page, and that has everything about the upcoming implementation in terms of who's distributing the survey, why we're collecting this cost information, and who will be receiving a survey. We've also recently launched our cost data visualization tool, and this was recently launched in December. The cost data, data visualization tool is an interactive application that summarizes co costs previously collected within the survey. So right now we have data from 2011, 12, and 15 posted. So you can see that an individual can query the information by gear and cost category, and then get the distribution of costs. And we see this as a tool for not only the scientific community to query these costs, but also for industry members to hopefully use the tool for business planning purposes. We also see this as a method to disseminate results of our survey. So in the upcoming iteration of the survey, once we gather that data, and aggregate it, we will display all of that information on, on this website. So that leads us to the next iteration of the survey. We are implementing the survey this year. So we're targeting March and April to start fielding our cost survey. And we're looking for costs incurred in calendar year 2022. That's why the name of the survey is 2022. All federally permitted commercial fishing vessel owners in the region will be sent a survey. So if an individual owns multiple vessels, we will pre-select a vessel for them and send them that survey. So they'll only need to fill one survey for, for this implementation. Survey participants will receive, receive notification by mail and email to participate in the survey. And we will send those letters and emails to the addresses, addresses listed on their federal permit application. A few more notes about the cost survey. We expect this survey to take around 60 minutes. And we do ask owners to use their tax information to fill out the various questions. So specifically their Schedule C tax form. If they don't have their tax form, then we ask them to use their best estimates. There are three different modes an individual can take the survey. They can either fill the survey online in hard copy format or, again, using the telephone or virtual interview option. In terms of the hard copy, we are mailing survey packets towards the end of our implementation. And there'll also be a prepaid return envelope included in that survey packet to hopefully make it easier for folks to send the survey back, back to us once they fill it. We're working with ICF Macro to help us program the online survey version, and they'll also be handling all of our mail correspondence. And then individual survey responses and participation will be kept confidential. This has been the case with the previous survey implementations as well. So any information that we provide in reports or on our cost data visualization tool, all of that information is aggregated in a way that you can't trace back to a single individual. And in terms of the participation, if someone calls us and asks if so-and-so took the survey, we do not provide that information. This is our contact schedule. So we're looking to start our mailings and emails in mid-March, and we will solicit participation over the course of seven weeks and end in late April. Each of our letters and emails will, will contain a link to the online survey version. And this is really to get folks to take the survey online. We're encouraging it because it increases the data quality and it also offers skip logic within the online survey. So it just makes it easier for folks to respond. However, we also are offering the opportunity to schedule an interview at any, course, at any point over the course of the implementation as well. 
Now, if a participant hasn't taken the survey uh, by the third mailing, we will mail them a survey packet. And again, within the survey packet, it will have a unique survey version tailored to their vessel. It will also include a double-sided fact sheet and results sheet, the instruction sheet, along with a paperwork reduction act statement, and again, the prepaid return envelope. Vessel owners will receive a reminder call midway through the sampling. And this is because it not only reinforces that this is a legitimate survey effort, but it also was very successful in recruiting folks to participate in our pre-testing events. So we're hoping this is also the case for this implementation. So in summary, the Greater Atlantic Region Commercial Fishing Business Cost Survey is coming to soon. We are looking to send it out in March and April. And the data can only be used if industry members respond to the survey. And again, the these data are needed for economic analyses to play a role in informant management. If you're asking yourself what you can do to help this effort, if you're a commercial fishing vessel owner, please fill out the survey when it's received. Others, if you could increase awareness and support for the survey, that would be really helpful for us. And of course, if you have any questions or thoughts on how to improve this process, please reach out to myself or Greg Ardini. Before I close, I just wanted to acknowledge the various groups that have helped us in developing this next iteration of the survey. First, fishing industry members who have provided input on developing those gear-based survey versions, um, Northeast Fisheries Science Center staff and GARFO staff within the Cooperative Research Branch, Port Programs Branch, and Research Communications Branch. They've really helped us with the communication and outreach around this survey effort. IBSS staff, for assisting in the design of the survey, as well as outreach materials. Um, ITD staff within the center, again, they've helped us with the cost data visualization tool. Also, Tanya Noteva was our primary developer of the tool. ICF macro staff for assisting in the implementation of the survey. And then additional SSB staff who aren't listed here, including Scott Steinbeck and our branch chief, Tammy Murphy, for supporting the survey effort. With that, I thank you for your time and attention today. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm going to fall guilty as in 2015 as being in the 94% that didn't mail back my survey. Um, do you do you think the low participation low participation is because the survey is too long, or fishermen just think it's none of your business? Well, I appreciate your honesty and I'm glad we were able to discuss it. I think it's probably both, but I mean, that's what we're trying to do. And that's what we've done since 2016. We've taken a critical look at the survey and tried to decrease the number of questions as well as the survey length. So we've really, we've made an end use for each question and made sure that it fits into our larger goal of estimating profitability. So we've really tried to prioritize which questions go into the survey. In terms of the none of your business, during our pre-testing events, we've had folks tell us that it isn't any of our business. So 100% of our response rate may never be the case. But at the same time, I think we're really trying to emphasize that if this cost data isn't provided, we can't give any information over to um, create economic analyses that inform management. So the way I like to think about it is there's all these data on the biological side, but we really don't have that economic extent of data. So this is what's really needed to strengthen those economic analyses. So maybe it's just the messaging around that. All right, thank you. Any questions or comments for Samantha? Sonny? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that presentation. And uh, I, I probably am guilty too. Um, but one of the things that I would like to ask and see is, you know, once it goes from the commercial fishermen, it goes to the uh, processor, consumer, truckers, restaurants, small shops, and to follow that out to get a big picture, not just the commercial fishing industry, but you know, all the way down to the consumer satisfaction of, of that product. And you know, that would probably make me feel a little better of when I get the survey that I get the whole picture and not just a little part of it. Thank you. Samantha. 
Yeah, I, I appreciate that very much. Um, we do have processor surveys and there's also processor surveys at a national level. So they're all kind of coming together. The problem with our survey is, and, and you need each piece of that and you need good response rates to each piece of that as well. So that's definitely something that's on our horizon and there's, there's definitely a need for multi-level assessments that you're talking about. So it's definitely not lost on me, thanks. Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for the presentation, Samantha. Um, just one quick question. So was were all three modes available the last time that you all did the survey as well? And also, I liked the online visualization tool. It was really cool. I poked around in there. Great, thanks for that support. Um, no, the, the interview option is a new feature, but the hard copy survey version and the online survey version are new. This time around, we do have additional email addresses, so we're hoping that will also increase the online participation again. And the world is in a different place than it was uh, back in 2016. So we're really looking forward to, to seeing hopefully those online results increase and also have additional participation for folks who want to call and talk to us directly to fill the survey. Michelle. And just a quick follow up. So for. Um... I mean, for the online version, is it like mobile friendly? Can you do it? Okay, good. Yeah, we've we've worked uh, hard, or we're actually currently working hard on developing that online version, which is mobile friendly. Um, that's something we are also hopefully going to be able to track and make sure we understand, you know, if folks are actually taking it on that mobile app as well. Dewey, did you get a survey? How'd you do on it? I'm going to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. <laughs> and my question is, uh, how about an economic multiplier after, it, it, as I'm always interested, I guess I've started getting interested in the economic multiplier after you know, what we're paid ex vessel. Sometimes I hear three or four times. I'm just wondering about the standardization of a multiplier that's uh, would be used ex past ex vessel. Thanks. So that's a really excellent point. Um, we have at the, Scott Steinbeck, the individual I mentioned at the end, he's within the social sciences branch. He actually does input output modeling with Implan, and he actually has used previous data from this cost survey to create those multipliers. So he has publications out using that information. So he actually, you know, he's a great proponent for this survey because he uses that information to create those multipliers that you see. So that work will continue to move forward. I think it's been a challenge in, to, in using the 2015 data for Scott because the response rate again was 6%. So there's just limitations we can do with limited response to the survey. Do it. That being said, I, my, my, my question was, what would be a, a multiplier you would use? Uh, two, three, four, seven, ten. I mean, just in general times, uh, uh, j just the observation of a um, across the dock, but the fisherman's paid and when it gets to somebody's plate, would you times it times two or three? You can be conservative or just I'm just asking a question, you know. That's a great question. I, I don't have an estimate of the multiplier. And even if I did using the 2015 information, it would be highly outdated. So I'd, I'd love to give you one after we get the results of the survey and if we're able to do that. And I can also um, get back to you on that because we probably have some from previous years. But again, we use the information from this cost survey to create those multipliers. So I'd, I'd love to give you an updated number rather than go back into the past where it may be um, outdated. Thank you. Dan Farnham, your last hope. See how you did in 2015. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry to say I didn't do it either. I did try though. I, I, I did sit down to do it. And I and I, I did do it. I did. <laughs> but it got it really got to be overly complicated. And when like for vessel upgrades, it was hydraulic costs, uh, uh, electronic costs. And it would have taken me a full day of work, honestly, to go through the checkbook or the bills and, and do it, do it right. And you want to do it right because you don't, you don't want to, you know, if you don't put it in all, all your account for all your costs then your profits going to look too big and you don't want that to happen either because it's not there. 
But you know, my thought was, um, if you're going to design a new survey, make it so that we can just look at our tax return and pull all the data you need out of the tax return. That was simplified on my part and on your part. You probably would get a, get a better response. And to that note, maybe the timing might be different. If you, if you, if you mail, did the mailing out a little bit later in the year, that, that way if people that did an extension or whatever, that way the tax return is ready to look at to, uh, you know, to do the survey. Thanks. Adam. Yeah, I really appreciate that comment. And I appreciate the idea about the tax re returns and, and making it match up with the tax forms. That's something that we've definitely heard and we've tried to do this time around. We've done that in pre-testing and saying, well, does this look like your fishing business? Does, do these costs match up? And so we've tried to do that as much as we can. In some of the areas that we're asking, we do look for a little bit more specific cost information because we want to track those over time because we know that certain policies are going, to, are going to change your safety gear or there's certain requirements on, um, you know, the electronics or something along those lines. Some One of those components can change. So to have that information over time would be really helpful for not only our economic analyses, but again, to be able to inform management decisions and, and say, how much is this going to impact if we make this change, how much is that going to impact the fishery and then overall profitability? So we have looked at tax, tax forms and tried to match it up as much as we can. Um, in terms of the timing of the survey, we've thought about that a ton. Um, we tried to do it around tax season, um, which is why we're targeting March and April. I mean, we think that was a great time. Not only that, but Greg Ardini put together a, an analysis of those dates and said, okay, is March better than April? What happens later in the fishing year? And we were able to target March because that's the lowest activity at that time while also you know, coordinating with the tax, tax season. Um, <laughs> some things are out of our control, like when we receive funding and when we can actually implement the survey. Um, so that's another, along with uh, Paperwork Reduction Act approval, so those are other layers, not to bore you, but those are other layers that are constraining us. Um, all good points, and we have thought about it, is what I'm, I'm trying to convey. Thank you. Any more questions or comments for Samantha? Michelle? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so just thinking about, like, you know, what Dan said in terms of the amount of time, and it's it's great to hear all the effort that you all have put into, you know, rethinking the survey to make it more accessible, easier to get to. Um, was, did y'all consider, or has it ever been considered in the past, like breaking it up almost? Like there, are there some elements that could be broken up into one module and some elements broken up into another module that might make it a little bit smaller of a, bite to chew for folks to fill out? I think I understand your question. So you're saying like potentially just ask the repair and maintenance section in one survey and then another survey and stagger it? Is that kind of, okay. Um, we've thought about that in some level. I mean, we've thought about, you know, creating a sampling frame that isn't 100%. We're getting very low responses, so that makes it really difficult. Um, we are trying to reduce, reduce burden where we can. So the issue, the issue with sending out the survey in chunks like that is that we won't get to the vessel level profitability, which is one of the primary goals of this survey. Um, it would take a really long time. And then not only that, because it's almost a, a, it's a census of vessel owners, we'd have to do that over time. So survey burden still becomes an issue. Um, it's something to consider in terms of how to chunk it out, but we'd love if we were able to get a baseline of the the census of vessel owners, then we'd be able to start thinking of how we can modify our sample, uh, be more selective and potentially stratify in different ways and or do what you're saying and, and potentially break it up or some other um, method, you know, only ask trip costs for some or have only a select set of vessel owners fill out the entire survey over X number of years. So it's thought about, but we'd love to have the ability to start with some profitability analyses. And for that, we really need the whole survey filled out by a good chunk of folks. Thanks for the comment. Though. Seeing no more hands around the table, anyone from the audience have a question, comment? Seeing none, thank you very much for your presentation, Samantha. And I will attempt to do better this year if I get a survey. All right, thank I appreciate you. Appreciate that.
Uh, next, we're going to have a overview of the Marine Research Education Program, the Atlantic Region Program Manager, Liz Moore. So, uh, hi, this is Lauren O'Brien, um, and I will be presenting on behalf of Liz Moore. She is out sick today. Is that my cue to start? I think they've got you uploaded and you're ready to go. All right, great. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, this is Lauren O'Brien. I'm the senior program manager with the MREP program, the Marine Resource Education Program. Um, many of you around the table are familiar with the program, and I'll give you all some time to chime in at the end of the presentation. I um, would love to hear from all of you because while I am the Senior program manager, I am um, not in charge of the curriculum. Um, it is a very collaborative process, as I hope um, we will be able to show. So um, I don't believe I have control of changing the slide. So if whoever has got that can change to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so first, I, I kind of wanted to give a background of MREP. Um, it was started in 2001. Two fishermen, uh, Mary Beth Tooley and John Williamson, came together. Um, because of just frustrations around how complex they felt the council system was and the seeming inability um, for them and other industry members to get anything done at the council. Um, and as many of you know, the council is full of jargon and has many moving pieces. And so with um, input from fishermen around the region, they decided to put together an educational workshop shop series, their goal being to elevate regional dialogue um, and ability to collaborate between fishermen, scientists, and managers um, at the New England Fishery Management Council. So this is kind of the why of how it got started back in 2001. Um, and if you click to the next slide, I have a short video um, because I figure why hear from me when you can hear from some of the fishermen who've been through the program um, and how they felt about it. When I got out of high school, I jumped on dad's rig and it just gets in your blood. I didn't have a problem getting up and going to work every morning. I enjoyed being on the water. And when I found that the fishing regulations were so complicated, I was angry. It is really frustrating to not have a say in what is happening to you. It's not just will the fish live or die, it's will the fishermen live or die. Well, why is this happening or why is this or why is that or they just want to shut it down and am i going to be able to survive hard i first heard about mrap from two fishermen got a hold of me and said hey i've got this great opportunity for you it's a program that that's by and for fishermen i was very skeptical going into that meeting and uh very enlightened coming out mrap gives you the recipe where does the data come from how do people use the data the laws and the steps that one goes through to translate into a regulation. I was afraid of the rulemaking process, but I think they listened to what everyone there had to say, including myself. MREP was really helpful in how I can be an active participant in the management of my fishery. And so we can actually click to the next slide because it's going to say to go to um... The when I got out of high school, I jumped on. There we go. Um, and so, as you all saw, the fishermen talking there were from the West Coast, the Pacific region, um, council region. And that was a video made for our West Coast program. We do have MREPs around the country. Um, but I like to share that regardless because I think that the, the message rings true across the regions. And folks who come to the MREP in the greater Atlantic region will um, say the same things. So wanted to kind of give you that perspective. And um, this slide was actually put together by John Carmichael, um, the South Atlantic Council Executive Director and a longtime MREP Southeast presenter. He put this together to just demonstrate how chaotic the process can seem. And you know, in reality, as we know, the process is complex, but with the right information and relationships, you can na navigate it effectively. And so that's what Mary Beth and John set out to do um, and what we continue to do at MREP. We give you the tools, the resources, opportunities, connect with each other across the industry and with some of the decision makers and show you how to be the most effective. Um, you know, we acknowledge that many of you are running businesses and don't have all the time in the world to understand the laws and the jargon. Um, so this is kind of why MREP exists. 
and you can go to the next slide. And again, um, we aim to level that playing field so you can speak the same language at the table, um, not just having a seat, but getting your voice heard um, and be able to more effectively work together, the fishermen and the scientists and managers. Next. Or as one MREP uh, attendee put it, fishermen are trained to catch fish, biologists, managers, and environmentalists are trained to save fish. And so um, this education kind of works towards the same goals in fisheries management. Um, as I said, we expanded into other regions. Uh, originally, it was just in New England and fishermen from the southeast, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, started to hear about the program um, and apply to come. But, you know, they were interested in Red Snapper and we were talking about cod. Um, the council in each region kind of interacts a little bit differently and runs a little bit differently, even though the same laws guide the councils. And so we... Um, we wanted to support the industry in other regions. And to do that, we decided, you know, we're going to have to develop a very separate program that um, is uniquely catered to the, the issues um, in that region. And so we created these steering committees, a leadership team from each respective region to kind of guide us. You know, we at Gulf of Maine Research Institute manage the program, but um, we're guided by a, a team, a committee, um, that is a, an assembly of fishermen from across the region. And that's how we were able to bring it down to the Southeast, um, the Gulf of Mexico and South Atlantic Council regions. We've since grown into the Pacific region. We're delivering our first one up in the North Pacific this April um, and kind of starting to scope out in the Pacific Islands as well. Um, and we do have a Caribbean program too. So we are kind of covering the, the full scope or will be covering the full scope of the country soon, hopefully. Um, but again, each region is really catered to the unique um, needs of industry in, in said region. So here is a picture from our recent steering committee meeting um, held up here in Maine. The Greater Atlantic Steering Committee, I think um, most folks were able to be there that you'll see in the picture. Um, and we really carefully selected uh, members of that committee to represent a broad diversity of fishing stakeholder interests um, across the New England and Mid-Atlantic region from recreational, charter, and commercial um, from a variety of fisheries. And then um, we have key scientist and manager partners from the council, from NOAA regional office and the science center. Um, and we come together each year to um, get recommendations and really make sure that we're not just meeting um, the interests broadly, but every year we're kind of reassessing, is this the most relevant and up-to-date um, way to educate fishermen who are coming through the program? You know, Are we giving them the tools that they would need to be successful? Next. Um, so these are some of the questions that the committee answers when we come together. Um, one other thing that I'll, I guess I'll, I'll give you all a minute to kind of read those questions. Um, and yeah, one thing that um, I will mention too about our steering committee is that they um, can really serve as mentors to folks that are new to the process, really trying to navigate it. Um, you know, everybody on the steering committee at one point was that new kid on the block um, trying to figure out the nuts and bolts and who to go to when to get your voice heard in the most effective way. So um, we really appreciate the um, commitment of the steering committee members to keeping education for fishermen alive and um, bringing in fresh blood to the process and found that the, the mentorship capacity of each of those um, individuals is really um, a wonderful asset to the program too. Um, and the next two slides show the faces of our steering committee members. Um, this is pulled directly from our website, so you can go on there and click their names. Some of them have email addresses um, or otherwise reach out to us if you wanna connect with any of them. Um, I'm sure you'll see some faces that are familiar to you, uh, many of them in the room today. And so we can go to the next slide. All right, so I've been talking a lot about um, the why it exists and the how it exists being our steering committee um, kind of collaborative curriculum design, but what is it? Um, it is a workshop series, an education um, 
educational focused, you know, really neutral um, workshop series. We're not trying to promote any sort of, you know, advocacy agenda. Um, but we cover the brass tacks in fisheries science and fisheries management as it applies to the council system um, to really provide participants with the knowledge, tools, and relationships um, to be effective in the council process. So the fishery science workshop, we don't have dates for the next series set yet, but it's typically a January, March cycle. So January, we would have our science workshop um, and you'll get a lot of information from presenters who come to us um, and you know we have a hands-on experiences and site visits that we do as well to see what otolith extraction looks like and talk about reproduction and gonads and you know how to do a fish dissection um, breaking down how a stock assessment works and you know what is that black box of a stock assessment that is so often talked about um, and then kind of you know forward looking and integrating ecosystem based management into um, into the council as well and some climate drivers conversations happen um, at that science workshop. And then, um, as I said, it's typically a January March cycle so in March, the same group would come back to the fisheries management workshop um, and this workshop, we cover the laws, um, a overview of the council process, how science concepts are integrated into the council, council process um, through the SSC advisory panels, um, and also the role of advisory panels, how you might be an effective member on one of those panels. Um, and then as well as, you know, negotiation chip tips, how do you um, effectively talk about an issue and recognize another person's perspective and um, kind of move the docket on those issues um and the role of law enforcement you know just all of the nuts and bolts and pieces that go into making a um an action into um into practice putting an action into practice and what it means on the water and um for the management of the of the fishery at large So the two-part workshop series we hold them once a year in each of our regions um and we are federally funded which enables us to pay for participants to come to the workshop. So we pay for you know, flights or reimburse for um, driving expenses, hotel costs, food during the workshops. Um, like I said, our next series is uh, the dates are pending, but we do accept rolling applications um, online. And I would definitely recommend putting your name in just while it's fresh in your mind. And we will um, circle back to you when the dates are identified for the next round. Um, but if you have any questions too on our website, you can go there and get our contact info and um, ask us about it and we'll we'll keep in touch when we do have those dates. Um, and one thing I, I failed to mention is who these are designed for. So I keep saying, you know, you can go ahead and apply. Um, and this is really for any anyone who is engaged in the council process, um, first and foremost for fishermen other associated industry as well. Um, and we are looking for a broad diversity of participants across um, you know, the Mid-Atlantic and New England Council regions, including all gear types, sectors, vessel sizes, geographies, experience levels. You know, We have participants apply who have been a part of the council process for years, if not decades in some cases, come through the program and say, you know, wow, I thought I knew everything, but um, but this was really great. And I I now know how to be effective in X, Y, and Z way that I didn't before. Um, so it really is for anybody who is engaged in or wants to be engaged in the council process. And you know, when I mentioned that we are um, an educational program first and foremost, um, we really take that seriously. We don't, um, you know, we don't want to be pushing any advocacy agenda. And so that is what my role and Liz's role and our other staff at GMRI are focused on doing. Um, we bring together a diverse group of leadership for our steering committee to get different perspectives and then tease, tease out kind of what the neutral approach would be. Um, we provide objective um, tools and, um, you know, processes for you to then take the knowledge that you gain to you know, move forward your own perspective, but um, MREP by and large is a neutral education program. And just for summary, um, you know, MREP is by and for fishermen. It is a collaborative 
curriculum development process, um, education first and neutral. And this is where I pass the mic over to anybody else um, at the table who would like to share their um, two cents and what MREP has meant to any of you. Peter Hughes. Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. I'll, uh, I guess I'll take the bait. I participated in the MREP program a number of years ago. Uh, in both the uh, management side and the science side, and I'll tell you, it was invaluable. Uh, it really was to prepare for, um, wasn't in preparation for the council at that time because I didn't have those aspirations at the time, um, but later on I did, and it really helped set me up for, um, to, to be able to participate in the council process um, and, and, and not look a fool, so to speak. Uh, so it is very, very valuable, and I, I, I got a lot of knowledge out of it, and it was a fantastic program. I had since been asked to come back to MRAP, MRAP and um, give a presentation and participate in uh, some of their activities, um, which, which I'm happy to do. We, they held a uh, program in Atlantic City one year. Uh, a number of years ago, so I, I, I think it, the program is 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 a highly successful program. I recommend it for for you know all age groups, you know, up and coming fishermen, through people that are even sitting on the councils, um, and you know just people who have an interest in fisheries, um, you know, just just general knowledge and of fisheries, um, you know, not whether or not they're going to get into management or not. Um, I'm really, really happy to see that the MRAP program has expanded to other regional fishery management areas um, because I just, I just think that the information and, um, you know, one of the slides was that, uh, you know, we don't, you know, we're not judgmental, we're not, uh, uh, MREP is neutral, and they are. You can ask them any questions, you can ask them, um, and if they don't know the answers, the People that are there at the room at the time, they'll they will get the answers and, and provide you with those answers. So, um, I, I'm a big supporter of the program, and um, I hope others uh, in the room who have taken the class um, have have similar feelings. So, so thank you, Lauren, and nice to meet you today. Skip Feller. Yeah, I just want to echo what Peter said. Same thing. I took it years ago. I think it was 2013. Tony Delorean was in there with me when I took it. That's how long ago that was. And it's the same thing. Being looking forward to being on the steering committee now and trying to get some young people in there. You know, the the up and coming fishermen. So because you do hear that so much. You know that that they're all against us and trying to get them to learn the process rather than be against it. Sam Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm a current steering committee member and I just did the science workshop in January. Highly recommend the program. Uh, I do know that there's a need for uh, attendees from the Mid-Atlantic. There was a lot of uh, New England attendees there. Uh, it was what they called a fire hose of information. Uh, from the science side, it was two completely packed days of information. But as long as I've been in this process from my perspective, wow, what did I learn? Uh, amazing on the science side. I'm looking forward to the management workshop uh, in March, which I'm attending to uh, not far from here. So highly recommend the program. Anybody in your uh, mid-Atlantic area, mid-Atlantic fisheries, uh, if they can understand this, it's just going to make this process so much easier uh, because in order to understand what you guys have to go through, we have to understand the reasons why it has to happen. So I'm really looking forward to the management workshop, but as a steering committee member, uh, I highly recommend the program uh, and I hope that you recommend it to others too. Thank you. Jason didn't. Thanks. Um, and, you know, part of the reason for having this today and, and thanks again, Lauren, is to just keep help getting the word out. Um, you know, my sense from having um, kind of provided some of the input on the management side at, some, at a couple of MREPs and a number of staff have, 
have been through. Um, and again, it seems like folks who go through it find it valuable. And certainly, um, you know, I've always found it valuable, both in terms of just learning more about fisheries, what people are doing, and how you know I I, I can kind of better reach out to fishermen and um, and, and communicate. So I think it, it definitely goes you know both ways. The folks who who help out running the different uh, modules learn a lot. Um, and um, yeah, as definitely um, council members, please, you know, keep um, kind of your your minds and eyes open for folks who you think um, could be, um, you know, good participants and, and would benefit from it. Um, and uh, that's it. Thanks. Scott Lennox. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to chime in here too. Lauren, great job on short notice with the presentation. Um, I participated in the, the Emirate program in Annapolis before I became a council member, and the information that I learned there has really been invaluable for what we do here on the council. So great job. I just fit, I just uh, filled out my um, questionnaire on when we'd like to have the next meeting and looking forward to getting more information on that. Thanks very much. Dan Farnham. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have the same opinion. I, I, I got recruited by John Williamson back in two, 2002, I think it was, one of the first one or two years. I was on the small mesh, multi-species AP in New England. But it, it was a real eye-opener. The whole, I took both courses, one after the other. But it was a real, it was really, really valuable. To this day, it's still valuable. I probably forgot a lot of it, but it's still, either way, it was, it really opened my eyes to the whole process. Um, and and I've, I've had my son took it, both, both courses. And anybody I see on the dock these days, if they want, if they talk about going to any council meeting, becoming an AP member or whatever, uh, this program's available. And I think it's, uh, it's a really good, good idea for them to, to take it and become involved. Thank you. Definitely some positive feedback on that. Uh, any questions now or comments for Lauren? Shout of all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I've been exposed to a couple of the other regional um, MREP programs in um, the Caribbean through some of the work I've done down there and the South Atlantic. And it's the same. I think you get the same rave reviews from the fishermen who've participated in that program. And I also want to say, you know, just the influence of this program has extended down to, you know, the state level. There are, I mean, at least like in North Carolina, the Sea Grant staff there have, you know, kind of taken the MREP program and made sort of a mini version of that, you know, for fishermen at the state level. There's a, a fish camp um, that folks there do um, that, you know, has been uh, influenced by the MREP program as well. So I think, you know, just kudos to the GMRI staff and everybody else who has, you know, all the fishermen who've been involved in making this program a success because the the influence goes far and wide. Thanks. Uh, not sure the name, whoever is listed on the VMRC staff, please state your name. That must be me. I apologize. I guess I don't know what ha I don't know what happened there. I think I logged in twice. Sorry. Um, like Michelle, I was involved with this when I was in the southeast. I actually sat on uh, NOAA's cooperative research review po uh, program that funded this in the southeast quite a bit. I just have a quick question about um how many applicants do you take you know how, how many participants do you have a year in the program yeah sure through the trip thank you for your question um i it, it i would like to say around 30 um 25 to 30 and it kind of depends on the price of flight tickets and gas at the time at any given time um you know, we budgeted for this a couple of years ago for our current funding and things as everybody knows has changed have changed in terms of price of um, flights and whatnot. But the short and easy answer is between 25 and 30. Any more questions or comments? See, we have no more questions or comments for you. Lauren, is there anything else you'd like to add today? Um, we can just go to the next slide really quickly. And this, uh, the arrow is pointing towards Liz, who I do think is on the call, though she's not feeling too hot. Liz, I don't know if you wanted to 
say hi um, and add anything that I've missed. Sure. Um, are you able to hear me? Yes, you sound fine. Perfect. Um, that's good. I'm glad to hear I sound fine because I uh, have been knocked out with the flu for the past few days. So yes, hello everyone. Um, I'm Liz Moore. I'm the program manager for the Greater Atlantic region that Lauren just walked you all through. She did a fantastic job. Um, I don't have anything else to add. I thought that last question about the number of participants was a good one. I think Lauren, something she keyed on the presentation was we really do focus on making this um, accessible. So part of the reason the cohorts do tend to be in that 25 to 30 range, just making sure that we are able to cover cost per participant. So certainly a big piece of it. Um, and Lauren has a website, or I should say a page off our website pulled up um, with our contact information for the staff at GMI. We're always here to help or to point you in the direction of one of our industry members or steering committees that can help you all get some answers. So um, thanks for letting me say hi, and thanks Lauren for taking on that presentation. Thank you very much. And Lauren, do you have anything else you'd like to add? I think that that is it, but thank you. Thank you all so much for giving us the time. And uh, I hope that we hear from some of you listening in um, through your applications or email. All right, thank you very much for the presentation. It sounds like you guys are doing wonderful work and appreciate that very much. Let's go to our final agenda item for today. Uh, Northeast Advisory Panel presentation. Anna Hart will be doing the presentation. And we just had, just for those that don't know, we just had our first NTAP in person meeting in three years. Anna was there, myself was, Dan was there, I was there. So it was good to actually see people in person for a meeting. Anna, whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and like said, like was said, um, we're going to go over the Northeast uh, Trawl Advisory Panel. Um, before I get into that meeting that the Mr. Chair talked about, I'm kind of going to go into a little bit of history about this group and then into the current structure of um, the Northeast Trawl Advisory Panel or NTAP. Um, so as many of you know, the Northeast Fisheries Science Center completes a bottom trawl survey on an annual basis. Um, the objectives of the survey is to monitor trends in abundance, distribution, and life history traits of demersal fish, um, and for this information to be included in appropriate stock assessments. Um, the survey also aims to monitor ecosystem changes. Um, the survey extends from Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, to the Scotian Shelf. Um, it is a stratified random design, and the strata is determined by depth and region. Um, the survey includes two sampling legs, um, one in the spring and a second in the fall. There is about 370 stations per season, and the number of stations per stratum is based on the stratum size and the variability of catch. Um, the survey utilizes a four-seam, three-bridle bottom trawl with a rock hopper sweep. Um, the original vessel used for this survey was the Albatross until about 2008, um, and that vessel retired that year, and then it transitioned to the Henry B. Bigelow, um, which is the primary vessel used today. Um, so the bottom trawl survey was initially implemented in 1963, and since the beginning, industry questioned the survey. Um, during the, that time, there were several efforts to include fishermen in the survey, including hiring fishermen as survey crew, um, as well as a number of catch efficiency studies to, um, were conducted to try and minimize that skepticism. Um, but then in 2001, a fisherman sailing on the survey uh, identified that the trawl wraps were of different lengths. Um, this error impacted eight surveys total between 2000 and 2002. And this air later became popularly known as Trawlgate. Um, following the situation, the Science Center held a workshop to examine um, the issue with stakeholders, and it eventually led to the development of a Science Center uh, stakeholder based advisory panel known as the Trawl Survey Advisory Panel, or TSAP. Um, the timing of the development of TSAP um, was also important given the overlap of the transitioning from the Albatross to the Bigelow, um, and given this. Uh, uh, overlap, uh, TSAP was primarily focused on designing the Bigelow trawl gear. 
Um, TSAP ultimately was successful at designing and testing the net currently used on the Bigelow. However, uh, the panel ultimately dissolved um, prior to the end of that calibration study uh, for a number of reasons, including members feeling poorly informed, disagreeing with some of the choices, like the choice on the trawl door type, um, and overall disagreement in the decision-making process. Um, but even though TSAP went away, there was still great interest in better understanding how the trawl gear fished. Um, and given this interest, the Science Center worked with industry members to complete additional catch efficiency studies to try and improve the survey as needed. Um, several of the studies accomplished between this time period are listed on this slide. So I'm not going to go into great detail or anything. Um, but one of the key challenges with the Bigelow was that it used a rock hopper sweep um, to maximize the ability to fish in all of these areas on the shelf. Um, but the rock hopper sweep also made it less efficient at catching flatfish. Um, so many of these studies focused on assessing the catch efficiency as well as feasibility of using industry vessels to help supplement this Science Center survey. Um, but there was still continued interest in further industry involvement in this um, Science Center survey. So around 2015, the director of the Northeast Fisheries Science Center at the time um, requested the council's reform a trawl advisory panel, um, but under the council structure this time, which ultimately led to the development of NTAP. Um, NTAP became a joint New England and Mid-Atlantic advisory panel with the intent to provide advice on fishery independent research surveys, uh, with the primary focus on the bottom trawl survey. Um, so the current structure of NTAP includes equal appointed members of both the Mid-Atlantic as well as the New England Fishery Management Councils or Council. Um, it includes two co-chairs, one from each of the councils, um, but staff support for NTAP primarily comes from the Mid-Atlantic Council. Um, NTAP consists of 20 members total, including council members and fishing industry, academic and government and non-government fishery experts. Um, and NTAP membership is reviewed and renewed on an annual basis. Um, there are three primary objectives for NTAP, um, which are outlined in the NTAP charter. Um, these objectives include better understanding the uh, Science Center trawl survey, gear and performance, evaluating the potential to complement or supplement surveys, and um, to improve the understanding and acceptance of trial survey data. So since the development of NTAP, um, there have been additional uh, catch efficiency studies um, that get at those panel's objectives that were listed on the previous slide. Um, and results of all of these studies um, on this slide have been published other than the last one. So that's the study in uh, 2022, uh, which is the restrictor rope research. Um, the team is working on, you know, finalizing the analysis for this project. Um, and I'll actually go into some preliminary results that we received at our um, previous NTAP meeting. Um, so just to kind of get into that NTAP meeting, uh, like Mr. Chairman said, we held an in-person NTAP meeting or actually a hybrid NTAP meeting with in-person attendance in Narragansett, Rhode Island, located at the Northeast Fishery Science Center Lab. Um, we had great attendance at the meeting and many indicated how great it was to be back in person again. Um, at this meeting, we had a full agenda and I'm going to go over those agenda topics and um, the key takeaways from the discussion at that meeting. So first off in the morning, the Science Center provided um, the group with an update on several topics. The first being the status of the NTAP operation manual. Um, this is just an informative document that outlines kind of the background of NTAP, similar to what I provided in earlier slides, as well as the goals of the group. Um, this small group of NTAP members is um, working to finalize the second draft of this document. And the next steps is to send out the second draft to um, all NTAP members, as well as the executive directors of, the bo of both of the councils. Um, there was also an update on the fall 2022 bottom trawl um, sampling season. During the fall period, there was a total loss of 14 sea days due to COVID-19. 
Um, the crew was able to get most of the Mid-Atlantic region covered, um, and the loss in days mostly impacted the northern stations. The Science Center uh, released a story about the impacts of these loss in sea days in early December, and the link is provided on this slide. Um, uh, Science Center staff also told us about um, tentative plans for the upcoming spring sampling period, um, and it's tentatively planned for a window of March 15th to May 26th. Um, lastly, we got an update on the bottom long line survey. Um, all planned long line stations were successfully surveyed, um, but they did have to resurvey two stations due to sharks splitting the long line. Um, during the sampling period, they had high catches of um, barn doored skates. Red hake, cusk, and large white hake. Um, but they had low catches of cod, which was consistent with what they saw last year, as well as low catches of haddock. Um, but they did see haddock or high catches of haddock in the spring sampling. Um, another topic of discussion, um, Science Center staff is working on exploring ways to better connect with the stock assessment process. Um, They're exploring multiple approaches to accomplish this. Um, and at the January meeting, they kind of walked us through this dashboard that they recently developed. Um, the dashboard is primarily um, being developed to collect and capture how the results from NTAP catch efficiency research is being used in stock assessments. Um, and at the meeting, there was a lot of valuable input and suggestions um, given to help improve the dashboard and science standards staff plans to incorporate those suggestions into the dashboard. Um, we also got an update on the restrictor rope research, um, some preliminary results. Um, so for this project, there were paired toes. Um, paired toes were done to basically uh, look at if a restrictor rope, or look, look at if adding a restrictor rope to a trawl configuration impacted catch at all. Um, this was a cooperative research project with the Durana R and there was a sampling period in both spring and fall of 2022. Um, during this project, they successfully completed 71 paired toes, so that's 142 individual toes. Um, the group working on this project is working to analyze the data, and they shared some preliminary results, as I mentioned, um, including that there was minimal effect on the net and door width when using the restrictor rope, and only subtle treatment effects on overall net performance which suggests the restrictor rope was working. Um, the analysts did note that um, more work needs to be done to assess the impacts on bridal angle, though. Uh, the group also looked at catch impaired toes with a focus on species that were caught in great abundance during both sampling periods. So this included scup, uh, butterfish, silver hake, and long fin squid. Um, and I'm not going to go into the full details of this comparison, but ultimately they found no effect on aggregate weights and for any of these species and only limited effect on individual links. Um, but they, that did vary by species as well as the variable analyzed. Um, and if you're interested in a more in-depth summary of these preliminary results, um, there's additional information in that draft and tap summary that was provided as supplemental materials, as well as the PowerPoint that was presented to the group um, on the NTAP page on the Mid-Atlantic website. Um, so following the restrictor rope presentation, the panel, um, oh, sorry, skip the slide. Um, the panel was encouraged by the results of this project and complemented the cooperative effort. Um, the group acknowledged it was a great starting point to help with standardizing regional trawl surveys, and they expressed interest in expanding these efforts to the Gulf of Maine. Uh, the panel also commented on the effect of gear performance or that the effect of gear performance could have been a result of the restrictor rope actually limiting the net width and holding a consistent shape. Um, the group recommended exploring doing an analysis on additional species that were still caught in good numbers, but maybe not to the extent of the species that they did analyze. Um, and they recommended the NTAP working group reconvene to discuss applications of this research, especially around offshore wind areas. Um, so given this feedback, the working group is tentatively planning to reconvene in April to have this discussion. Um, so NTAP also got an update on offshore wind. Um, the update was provided by Science Center staff again and was similar to past council updates. 
Um, during this discussion, there was general frustration with the overall process, and many questioned how comment letters and suggestions sent to BOEM and um, the develop went for the developers is actually being considered or even adopted. Um, there was also expressed frustration around um, that there's currently no standardized survey requirements, and many expressed that any when, when collected data should be made publicly available. Um, there was also much concern about the loss of livelihood that will be a result of offshore wind development. And there was general frustration and concern of how the NEMAP brand is being misused. Um, and it was noted at the meeting that there's a separate group working on a formal definition for NEMAP to prevent any future misuse of, of that brand. Um, and during this conversation, there was also apparent, it was also apparent that NTAP members wanted to be more involved in um, the wind discussion. And they kind of talked about how they could be more involved or more incorporated into this process. And a few ideas discussed included um, providing input to the councils um, to be added to the comment letters as appropriate, or maybe helping with develop a, developing a standardized approach for wind surveys. So um, following that lengthy wind conversation, which took up uh, more time than I care to admit, um, NTAP broke out into two breakout groups um, to kind of discuss future priorities of this group. Um, each group was charged with exploring a, a different topic of discussion. Um, the first group, uh, the topic was understanding trawl gear performance and methodology. And the second group discussed the topic of evaluating the potential of to complement or supplement current um, science center surveys. Um, so as you can see on the slide, both groups came up with a number of ideas for each of the topic. Um, just for a couple examples, group one discussed utilizing acoustic instruments to help with understanding gear performance, evaluating fishability around wind farms, and additional door and net spread testing. While the second group came up with the idea of calibrating NEMAP and the Bigelow, um, supplementing the Bigelow with um, by expanding the Maine, New Hampshire, or NEMAP surveys, as well as possibly extend, expanding the industry-based survey fleet, um, just to name a few. So after these breakout groups, the full group, group reconvened and had you know, a much larger, larger discussion on future priorities. They reported out what each group came up with and then kind of um, developed some key takeaways on what the whole group wanted to focus on. Um, and this just kind of highlights the key takeaways. There's much more additional information in that um, summary that's uh, posted in meeting materials. Um, but there was a strong interest in complementing or supplementing the current um, Science Center surveys, especially given that there are years where there's a loss in effort due to um, gear conflicts, as well as loss in uh, sea days for various reasons. There was also interest um, given the Bigelow cannot fish around wind farms as well as interest to supplement current surveys to better capture other habitats and or species. Um, I'd also like to note that during this discussion, um, there was some tension um, between the group about whether we should focus on catch efficiency work versus moving to other studies. Um, but the Science Center expressed particular interest in um, focusing on supplementing the survey, especially since the Bigelow can't sample those offshore wind farms. Um, so overall, the January meeting went great, um, and you know we had a full discussion, full day um, of a lot of interesting points and ideas, and the group was very supportive of reconvening in summer of 2023, um, and they request an additional or another in-person meeting if the budget allowed, um, and there were a couple recommended um, agenda topics for that meeting. Um, they wanted to take a deeper dive into offshore wind monitoring plans, and there was a request to have someone from an uh, offshore wind developer to actually come and speak with the group. Um, and before I go to questions, just want to give a shout out to Catherine Ford, who I believe is on the webinar. She is the Science Center lead for NTAP, as well as our two co-chairs, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, to our council, Wes, as well as Daniel Salerno. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you for the report. Uh, any questions for Hannah? Comments for Hannah?
Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I guess I was curious about the um, the discussion on the NEMAP brand being misused. Like, can you elaborate more on, like, I'm just curious what that means by misused. Yeah, so um, apparently uh, wind farm surveys, they're uh, kind of saying that they're following NEMAP protocols and they might not necessarily be doing that. Um, so there was concern about that. Joe Savino. Yeah, just to that point, Michelle. So we're, we're seeing it in some of the fishery monitoring plans that are required from a few of those states. Any more questions, comments? Anyone from the audience? I do not see any. Thank you very much, Hannah, for your presentation. Uh, I guess before we adjourn for the day, uh, two announcements. Maybe even though in the briefing book it says 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, for those that just that missed it yesterday, it is at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Yeah, Chris tried to get it at 10, but yeah. And hospitality in room 406. And with that, that concludes today's agenda. We'll see everybody tomorrow morning at 9. Thank you.